Bishop Nick uh, Holtman of Salisbury to miss a few words, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the honour of inviting me to, to contribute to this trialogue uh, in honour of Saida Fatima. Um, London, uh, I'm a London parish priest, I'm not the Bishop of Salisbury, not yet, I won't be the Bishop of Salisbury for two more months, but it's very, very nice that you uh, have designated me that uh, already. Um, I'm a London parish priest, and I've worked in Tower Hamlets, and I am the Vicar of St Martin in the Fields in Trafalgar Square. And in London, over 300 first languages are spoken in our schools. Um, this is a world in a city, and it's possible for us to live alongside each other in peace. That's not only important for our city and country, but it's an act of witness to the world. In 1979, I went to work in Stepney in East London. Historically, Stepney is a Jewish part of London, and I was the last Christian chaplain to the London Jewish Hospital just before it closed because the Jewish population was getting older and moving out and being replaced by a growing Bangladeshi community in that part of Tower Hamlets. It was immensely moving listening to the stories of these elderly Jews, many of whom had fled Germany just before the war and whose relatives had died in the Holocaust. Um, and then with the growing Bangladeshi community in Tower Hamlets there was a need for the community to get to know each other in new ways and we found religious dialogue was difficult for us because if I went to the mosque then we would get prepared positions where I would hear what people wanted me to hear and it wouldn't be so much a dialogue as a debate where you're trying to beat one another down in order to establish that my truth is stronger than your truth. But in a dialogue, we meet each other and learn to listen to our truths together. So I think what I learned at that stage of my life was that it was important for communities to learn to meet in ways that were not threatening to each other. <coughs> and my wife was the secretary of the Ocean Estate Tenants Association, and we found that by meeting over food. It's a simple thing, isn't it? Um, religious communities know about meeting over food. We all do, and the importance of a shared meal. But by meeting over food and enjoying each other's different cultural traditions, we met each other in such a way that we began to want to address those issues in our community which were common. A shortage of school places, a lack of employment for our youngsters, the fact of racism on the estates of East London. And we found that a common concern for justice was fed by the values of our different faith traditions. So we began a method of working which was not, in the first instance, religious-based, but which was informed by our different religious traditions. And that same experience was something that we used when I was vicar of the Isle of Dogs in the late 1980s through to 1995. And you might remember that Britain's first BNP councillor uh, was elected on the Isle of Dogs and caused a huge crisis for that community, which we had to try to work through together in order to get him removed at the following uh, May uh, council elections. So it's not optional for the different faith communities to work together. And that's both because of the, spirit, the human spirit's longing for truth and for God, but also because of the social and political importance of religion in our time. On the Sunday after 9-11, BBC Radio 4 came to St Martin in the Fields for the broadcast of Sunday worship. It was important to us that we were able to hold that act of worship with the presence of a rabbi, Rabbi Mark Weiner, and an imam, uh, Dr. Zaki Badawi, in order that we could resist the impact of terrorism which seeks to divide us and stand together to pray for peace and read from our scriptures and seek a common good. We've done similar things since, and it's important to show that people of faith 
can stand together in our different religious traditions, saying clearly that peace is something we each seek. I asked my clergy colleagues at St. Martin in the Fields what I should say about Mary, the mother of Jesus, in a trialogue about three women in our religious traditions, Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Saida Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. In Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions, three great women. My colleagues talked about the religious tendency to idealize women and thought that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had suffered from this idealization in Christian thought. They wanted to emphasize her humanity and we wondered what sort of conversation there might be if Miriam, Mary and Fatima were here in this room with us. One who has worked for almost half his life in Indonesia and the Pacific Islands said that in simpler parts of the world, Benaz, there's a tremendous power to motherhood, children and family which perhaps gets lost in our more complex cultures here in London. My colleagues wanted to uh, <coughs> ensure that I talked about the difference of our sacred texts and to recognize that what we have as Jews, Christians and Muslims are different sorts of books, although they tell some of the same stories. For example, if I bring my Christian Bible, it is in English and it is the tradition for Christians since the invention of the printing press and the Reformation and just before to translate the scriptures into the vernacular and it's a tradition which is rooted in the way we handle scriptures from the beginning with a Hebrew Bible shared with Jews, a Greek text in the New Testament which is translated into Latin and has been translated since into the vernacular. So there's something here about the Christian Bible which is a library of texts, 66 books written over a period of a thousand years telling of the stories of God and God's people enlivening us and judging and purifying us and in which Mary is one of the figures who provides an example of how to live a holy life and we've already heard quoted the song of Mary from when the angel announced to her that she would bear God's son in which the lives of the rich and powerful will be overturned and the poor and lowly lifted up. Every religion contains an account within it of what it is to be human and in the Christian Gospels we hear of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary, Christ's mother, is an example of sacrificial love and she represents what it is to be obedient to the call of God. As a young woman she responded to the announcement by the angel that she would bear God's son faithfully and in her response she magnifies God as it were enlarging our appreciation of God and recognizing that in her call God overturned the, overturned the order of this world by not using the powerful and mighty but raising up the humble and the lowly. In the account of Jesus' suffering, his passion, his crucifixion, the male disciples did not perform well. One betrayed Jesus, one denied Jesus, the others ran away. By contrast, his mother Mary and the women in the company of Jesus are said to have stayed through the crucifixion, either watching at a distance, or in John's Gospel, Mary, there, there stood Mary, his mother, at the foot of the cross. It can be confusing to non-Christians that there are several Marys named in the Gospels. Mary Magdalene is the best known of these other Marys, and she is a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Christian tradition, the stories about Mary Magdalene have been conflated from a number of stories within the Gospels where a woman who is not actually named becomes associated in Christian tradition with Mary Magdalene. 
She was possessed by seven demons and healed by Jesus. She was a woman of the city who was a sinner. And therefore a person who exemplifies what it is to be a follower of Jesus, healed and made whole, forgiven and renewed. Jesus said it's the person who's been forgiven much, who will love much. And Mary Magdalene is identified as the woman who poured costly ointment over the feet of Jesus, anointing him at the start of the journey that leads to his death and the cross and the wiping his, and wiping his feet with her hair. Mary Magdalene has been made by Christian tradition to be an idealised but very human, flawed figure. Mary, the mother of Jesus, has been idealised in such a way that she does not seem so earthly. She's been said by some to be perpetual virgin and queen of heaven. Ideas which seem to me to highlight the problem Christians have in bearing witness to God come among us in human form. The God-bearer, Jesus' mother, Mary, takes on a unique role which raises her above the rest of us. Yet the Christian Gospels show her to be the most human. Young, fearful, full of wonder, and she stays with her son through what must be the greatest fear of any parent, the death of their child. As with Miriam and Fatima in Judaism and Islam, the person we meet here in Mary, the mother of Jesus, is also an archetype of the human, the best of humanity revealed in the most ordinary and difficult of circumstances. Just over a year ago, two women visited St. Martin in the Fields from the parents' circle in Israel-Palestine. Both had sons killed in the conflict between Israel and Palestine. In this extraordinary group, bereaved families, victims from both sides, have embarked on a joint reconciliation mission while the conflict is still active. The parent circle consists of several hundreds of bereaved families, half Palestinian and half Israeli. Since its inception in 1995, it has led a reconciliation process between Israelis and Palestinians. Their mission statement is to prevent further bereavement in the absence of peace, to influence the public and policy makers to prefer the way of peace on the way to the way of war, to educate for peace and reconciliation, to promote the cessation of acts of hostility and the achievement of political agreement, to prevent the usage of bereavement as a means of expanding enmity between people, to uphold mutual support between our members. I was struck by the willingness of these mothers to acknowledge their own and each other's pain. And I was struck by their commitment to try not to take sides or to demonize the enemy. It seems to me that they exemplify the best of what it is to be human and are the best examples I know of what it, is, of what it might be like were Miriam, Mary and Fatima to be here in conversation today.